Hi, I'm Jamie with Chag Tutors. Today I want to talk to you about a theory and a movement in psychology called cognitivism. We'll talk a little bit about the history, about current experimental approaches, and then about the applications of this theory. Cognitivism is a reaction to behaviorism, which we'll talk a little bit about in the history of cognitivism. It's interested really in information processing and came about around the same time as people really got interested in artificial intelligence and how to program computers to have mental processes just like humans do. In cognitivism, the mind is not a black box. We're not just observing behavior. We're theorizing about perception, thoughts, memory, learning, and attention. And this is not just a theory, but has many applications in therapy and especially education. In behaviorism, which is really championed by people like B.F. Skinner, the mind is a black box. All we can observe is behavior. We have a stimulus like a bell and a response, even from something like a dog, like salivation. B.F. Skinner did a lot of experiments where he's trying to condition the dog to respond with salivation, not just to food itself, but just to the bell, which signals the promise of food. He's not worried about the cognitive processes going on inside the dog, of course, but he is worried about the behavior that the dog exhibits. This behaviorism is still rampant in education, in things like applied behavior analysis for students with autism, where people do a functional behavior analysis. They observe the student, they only observe the antecedents of a behavior and its consequences, and they try to determine what the function of the behavior is. They do not theorize about what the student is thinking or feeling at the time, but only observe the behavior and try and determine what the behavior is doing and why it's happening, not from their minds, but from ideas about what kinds of functions behaviors have, like attention seeking and other things. Let's talk a little bit about the history of cognitivism. In 1948, Wiener publishes on cybernetics. This is the start of cognitivism for a lot of people and really ties it into artificial intelligence. Tolman, also in 1948, publishes on cognitive maps, conceptual ideas that people develop based on perception and other inputs to their system. The idea of input and output becomes important, but it's also mediated by the cognitive processes in between, which people are really interested in. Tolman runs a lot of rats through a lot of mazes and realizes that animals have internal representations of objects, they run through a maze and can actually remember part of how the maze is formed and may have an internal representation of how that works. Piaget, in the 1930s, even earlier, studies cognitive development in children for the first time. Previously, children have been thought of as sort of mentally deficient adults. They're not quite up to snuff, but they are basically the same as adults. Piaget says there are stages of development. One of the more interesting ones being what he calls formal logic, where students are finally able to deal with things like algebra and very abstract concepts. He says students are not able to do this before the ages of 11 or 12. Now, we don't know if this is exactly true, but we do know that this has had a great influence on education and speaks sort of against the current trend in education to accelerate kids so much that they're accessing advanced material at an age where they may not be ready for it. Piaget also studies applications of his stages of development as applied to learning and concepts like justice, number, time, and causality, very abstract concepts that we really need to understand what's going on in the mind to understand how children deal with these concepts. We can't just look at their behavior. Now, some of the experimental methods in cognitivism, which you think would be very difficult because you're trying to understand what's going on in someone's mind. You're almost trying to mind read, but in a scientifically valid way. There are lab experiments that are done with animal models, especially, and with humans. But these are controversial, since what we see in the lab is very controlled and specific to one cognitive process, whereas what we see in real life might not translate from the lab. It might be very much more complicated with more stimuli or inputs and a wider range of responses. 
We also use descriptive methods like introspection, where someone describes what's going on in their mind as they're solving a problem or dealing with an emotional state. We use interviews. We use case studies, just like in neurology. And we use computer modeling, which is a way that cognitivism, again, connects to artificial intelligence. There are a lot of applications of cognitivism. Again, we've talked about artificial intelligence and how we really want to program computers to model mental processes, which is a very difficult task. Um, we also have things in therapy, like cognitive behavioral therapy, which has really been on the rise, especially in school psychologists, where people try and identify a cognition, a thought that a person is having in response to an incident, and to change that cognition. For example, someone's maladaptive cognition might be, I'm an awful person. They might change that cognition to mediate it a little bit and say, I did something wrong in this situation. This is in, in contrast to Freudian theory and psychodynamics or psychoanalysis, which tries to go back and not deal with the current presentation of the issues, but really what's gone on in the past. Cognitivism is really focused on current mental processes that are going on and not on the history or even on the behavior. It's been criticized for this, but it's also been a very powerful tool for things like depression and anxiety. Within education, people are thinking about analyzing errors that children make in learning, thinking about the misconceptions that children have and what this might mean about at their developmental age, how do they represent these abstract concepts that people are teaching them. People are also really interested in memory and how students can store ideas long term. We know that lectures work in some ways but may not be the most effective way of teaching. We know that people learn often better by doing than by hearing. And we have many other applications of cognitivism to education. We're really trying to understand how students learn and how we can optimize how students learn to make sure they're not just succeeding in our classrooms but also developing lifelong learning habits that will extend far beyond our classroom. These are all very difficult problems, but very much worth it. I hope you'll continue to study cognitivism and behaviorism and the history of cognitivism as a very powerful tool for understanding how the mind works and a really important element of current psychology, not just in theory, but also in all the applications of psychology to social life, to education, and to artificial intelligence. Thanks for watching and come back next time.